Hello, this is the third and the last lecture regarding deadlock. This time, we're going to talk about deadlock detection. In this lecture, deadlocks are not avoided nor prevented. They will be detected by an algorithm very similar to Banker's algorithm. If deadlock prevention or avoidance are not used, then a deadlock situation may occur. Therefore, we need an algorithm that can examine the system state to determine whether a deadlock has occurred. This is a deadlock detection algorithm. A second algorithm that can help us recover from a deadlock. This is a recover algorithm. We will emphasize the dead deadlock detection algorithm. We just touch upon a little bit about recovery algorithm because recover is more complex than we can expect. It. So a deadlock detection algorithm does not have to know the maximum need max of a process. Because we don't know max, we are not able to compute need. As a result, a deadlock detection algorithm only uses available, indicating how many units of each resource type is available, and allocation for each process, how many units of each resource type it has received, and the request, which means how many units of each resource type a process has requested. So a deadlock detection algorithm works like Banker's algorithm without need. More precisely, when the request of a process is less than or equal to the current available, then the request to resource are allocated. Previously, we also examined whether this allocation would be uh, safe if it is allocated. So those processes that cannot get a request, request to resources may involve in a deadlock. Here is the deadlock detection algorithm. If you compare this deadlock detection algorithm and the safety algorithm, you will find out they are very similar. The only difference is we do not have the need array. So first of all, we copy the current available array to a working array and set every process uh, i's finish i entry to false, the same as the uh, safety algorithm. Then for each i, we search the array to see, to find a unfinished process and uh, check to see whether its request is less than or equal to work. In other words, step three, try to find a process that is not yet finished, whose request is less than or equal to the current available. If no such I exists, go to step five. Otherwise, we pretend that uh, the allocation can be uh, satisfied with it allocation to work so that we have a new work. That is, after it's done, we take, after it is done, we assume that process I would return everything, including those resources that have been allocated to it. So after process I is done, we take everything back and add it to the temporary working array of available. And then set that process to true, indicating it is done. And then go back to step three, find another process that is not yet done and whose request is less than or equal to the current 
available working at rate. So we keep going and going until we couldn't find such I. And then we have this. If every finish is done, the system is safe. No deadlock. If finish I is forced for some I, then the corresponding process PI is deadlocked. So basically all of those processes whose finish is equal to false, those processes could not get the resource and the deadlock happens. So please compare this detection algorithm with the safety algorithm. You see, it's very, very similar. Instead of working with the need array, we use request. So please do not hesitate to pause if you feel it is necessary. Now, if you are back, let's take a look at an example. Suppose currently we have this allocation table and this request table, and currently nothing is available. Now, if you sum the column for X, it is a maximum uh, available. And that you sum uh, for resource X, if you sum the Y column, it is the maximum available of the resource Y. And if you sum all the Z column entries, it is the maximum available of the Z resource. Why as it is maximum? Because nothing is available here. So let's use the detection algorithm to determine whether this system is deadlocked or not. Again, we scan the entry top down so that you and me will find the same results. Of course, if you change the scanning from bottom up or randomly, uh, you definitely would get a different sequence. However, whether a system is safe or not won't change. So we scan the first A. A's request is less than or equal to available. And therefore, we could run A. After A is done, A would return 0, 1, 0. So the new available is 0, 1, 0, as pointed out here. Therefore, A is done. We remove it. Now we scan the request down again from top down. And B cannot run because B's request is not less than or equal to available. But we could run C, of course, because C requests nothing. So when C, we just run C, when C is done, C returns 303. So the new available would be. 313 is shown here. So now C is done. The new available is 313. In this case, you could run any process. But let's again uh, scanning top down. The first one whose request is less than or equal to available is B. After B is done, B return to zero, zero. The new available is five, one, three. Now, when we have available five, one, three, we could run either D or E. Therefore, every process in the group A, B, C, D, E has the finish indicator set to true. Therefore, the system is not in a deadlock state. Hopefully you, you will go through this very simple example before moving on to the next example. Now, this is the second example. Assuming that for some reason, the system allocated one, one unit of, uh, make a request of one unit of as resource Z in this way. That is C allocation is not changed, but C previously we have zero, zero, zero. What if C request one, 
resource, one unit of resource Z. Is this a deadlock state? Let's find, figure it out. Again, we could run A because A's request is less than or equal to available. So far, so good. Then A returns zero, one, zero, and available become zero, one, zero. So A is done. Now, <clears throat> let's scan the request. Two, zero, two is not less than or equal to zero, one, zero. And the C's zero, zero, one is not less than or equal to available. So D share the same and G request is not less than or equal to available. Therefore, none of the B, C, D, and E could be selected in step three. As a result, step three will simply exit. Then we are in step five. In step five, we found four processes, a, uh, four processes, B, C, D, and E, whose request, uh, whose finish is false. Therefore, B, C, D, E are involved in the deadlock state. So the use of table can easily be implemented, but in the early 70s, a computer scientist host found out we could also represent this uh, detection algorithm in a graphical way. And this is referred to as resource allocation graph. It's very easy to understand, although we have many slides. So suppose we have M resource types, R1, R2 to Rm. And resource type Ri has Wi unit. So each resource type is represented by a rectangular knot in which each dot indicates a unit. So in this example, uh, we have resource type K. We have three dots, meaning WK, the number of resource of resource, number of unit in the resource type K, RK has three units. And the system has N processes, P1, P2, 2PN. Each process is represented by a circular knot. We're going to construct a graph. So we have P, process PI, process PJ, resource type RK has three units. So this is the way of constructing process knot and the resource knot. Process knot, inside the process knot doesn't have dots, but inside the square resource knot has number of knots, indicating how many units maximum number of units are available. Now, after constructing the knots, we're going to add edges. Two rules. If process uh, PI make, makes a request to use a unit of resource RJ, we draw a directed edge. Notice here, direct edge from PI to PJ. So, the second rule is if process PI receives a resource of type RJ, then draw a directed edge from a dot of RJ to PI. The way of co this construction would produce a resource allocation graph, we normally uh, call it a rack. So let's take a look at this. Remember, RK resource type of three units. Here, we draw a directed edge going from a unit to a process PI. It means PI 
has currently been allocated a unit of RK. Now, the PJ requests to use two units of RK, we draw two arrows here. So here it means uh, process PJ requests to use two units of RK. So when these two units of RK becomes available, this arrow would be going from this dot to PJ, and this arrow would be changed to from a dot of RK to PJ. Here, I use dashed arrows to indicate requests. A solid arrow indicates allocation. But not all literature would use this symbol. I use this, this kind of a notation, dash arrow <coughs> indicating request, solid arrow indicating uh, allocation, just for easy to spot which arrow is request, which arrow is an allocation. So look at this diagram. We have process P1, P2, P3, and we have three resource type R1, R2, and R3. Resource type R1 and R2, each of the resource type R1 and R2 has one unit, but resource type R2 has two units. Now examine process P1. Process P1 requests a unit of resource R1, and it has already been allocated a unit of resource R2. Now for process P2, it is allocated one unit of R1 and one un unit of R2. And uh, it is requesting a unit of R3. And this unit is not available because it is allocated to P3. So examining these arrows, uh, the units of R1 is allocated to P2, this unit of R2 is allocated to P2. And the P1 is requesting a unit of R1, and P2 is requesting a unit of R3. So it's easy to see the allocation and the requests. Now, why there will be so many slides here in this unit, even though each unit, each slide is just provide with just a little information because I want to share with you the table representation and the the rack representation are actually the same thing. Let's take a look at this diagram. Now, <clears throat> with this table, we could construct this rack. Look at A. A has been allocated, uh, uh, process P0. P0 has been allocated one unit of A, one unit of C, and one unit of D. So for the P0 not, it is allocated one unit of A and one unit of C and one unit of D. And the process zero is requesting one unit of B and one unit of E. So P0 is request one unit of B and one unit of E. And the current available with the A, B, C, D, E is two, one, one, two, one. <clears throat> two unit of A, one unit of B, one unit of C, two unit of D, and one unit of E are available. Now take a look at process P3. Process P3 is allocated nothing because it has no solid error leading to P3. And now P3 requests one unit of A, C, and E. So P3 requests to use one unit of A, one unit of C, 
and the one unit of E. So as you can see, when we have a table, you can easily construct a rack. Conversely, if you have a rack, you can easily convert it to a table. So let's run the uh, deadlock detection algorithm and see how the rack changes and vice versa. Now look at here, P0's request is less than or equal to the current available. Look at it, one is less than or equal to one, one is less than or equal to one. So we know P0 can run. After P0 runs, P0 would return one, zero, one, one, zero. As a result, the new available would be two, one, one, two, one, plus one, zero, one, one, zero, becoming three, one, two, three, one. Now, because A is done, everything allocated to A can be removed. Therefore, this arrow can be removed, and uh, this arrow can be removed, and this arrow can be removed. Then we have this table. P0 is done. P0 is done. All the allocation error and uh, uh, request error are removed. Now we scan the request again. We found out P0, P1's request is less than or equal to available. Therefore, after running and finish, finishing, P1 would return one, one, zero, zero. So the new available would be three, one, two, three, one, plus one, one, zero, 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 which is four, two, two, three, one. So remove, uh, returning uh, the allocation means remove the arrow leading to P1, the allocation arrow leading to P1. After doing that, we have this. Now we can run P2 because P2 is available. Uh, P2's request is less than or equal to available. So P2 at the end would return 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, making the new available 4, 2, 2, 4, 1. Of course, the arrow going from resource D to P2 here must be removed, we have this. And finally, <clears throat> P3 can receive its request and then run because P3 has no allocation. So we don't have to worry about those arrows leading to P3. When P3 is done, we have this. So, this illustrates equivalence of the, the table representation and the, the rack represent, representation. Now, if you are used to, to use the table to do detection, that's fine because it's easily implementable. But the use of rack is also convenient. If you work on paper, of course, the, it can also be converted to table and use table search, or if you are used to graph algorithms, that's also be implemented easily. So the next one is how can we, how can we use the previously a discussion of the correspondence between table with the detection algorithm and the graph operation, that is removing the allocation and uh, requesting uh, directed edges. This is referred to as rack reduction. Let's consider a process, PI. Let's assume that PI is not blocked. If PI is blocked, it means uh, it's out of control. 
due to whatever reason. Of course, this does, does not mean PI is dead block. Here, block means due to whatever reason, for example, input output or waiting for some communication irrelevant to uh, deadlock. A PI is not an isolated one. Isolated means it has no edge leading to it or going out from it, which means P, that means this process is done. So assuming that process PI is neither blocked nor an isolated knob. So we define reduced reduction. A rack is reduction, reduced. What, how do we do that? We re remove all edges to and uh, from PI. For an example, if I want to reduce this rack by P0, it means remove this arrow, this arrow, this arrow, this one, and this one. So after removing all of these edges, P0 becomes an isolated knob. So when can I do this reduction? Well, as you know, we get rid of this arrow means a process can receive the request resource and run and finish. Therefore, PI can be used to reduce a rack if and the only if its request is less than or equal to available. For an example, look at this request edge. P0 requests a unit of B, well, this is available. Look at this edge, P0 requests to use a unit of E, resource E, uh, which is also available. Then we give this unit to P0. So the arrow change to this. And we could also allocate this unit to P0. P0. So the arrow become, going, become here to here. So P0 now has everything it needs it run, then return everything. So returning everything means removing all the page to and from P0. P0 becomes a isolated knot. So one more concept. A rack is completely reducible if all edges of the graph can be removed by a sequence of reduction. Now look at P0. Can we remove P0 as a candidate for our step? Yes, we just mentioned. Can we pick P1 as the first candidate to execute a reduction? P1 need one of this is available. P1 also need one of this is available. So P1 can be chosen as the first candidate. Can we choose P2? Yes, P2 only did one of this. So we'll just give this unit to P2. P2 could run and finish. And can we do that for P3? Yes, of course. So in this rack, every process can be chosen as the first candidate to start our rack reduction. As we we've seen in our uh, table representation discussion. This graph can be completely reduced. We just saw it, right? Then we introduce a theorem called the, the deadlock theorem. The deadlock theorem states that a state of resource allocation is a deadlock state if and the only if its corresponding rack is not completely reducible. Given a rack representing a resource allocation state. Now we we find a knot. We find a knot whose request is less than or equal to available. If that is the case, we, we remove all of the stuff by examining the graph rather than the table. If you could remove the arrows of every process so that at the end, 
every process knot is a isolated knot, then that rack is co completely reducible. What if you cannot do that? That is, the rack still have some errors that cannot be reduced or removed. Then that the system allocation is in a deadlock state. Now recall that in the first lecture, we said the necessary conditions for having a deadlock are mutual exclusion, no preemption, hold and wait, and the circular waiting. But now mutual exclusion usually uh, can, cannot be removed and preemption is not so good because sometimes you simply cannot preempt something while a process is using it. So here, the necessary condition implies that hold and wait and the circular waiting must both hold. Therefore, this incompletely reducible rack must have a circle must have a cycle. That is, if we have a deadlock, if and only if the rack is not completely reducible, which means after some reduction, you will see a cycle. A cycle means circular waiting. The uh, uh, rack already fully illustrate hold and wait. If a rack does not contain a circle, the state resource, the state of this resource allocation is deadlock free. So we are aiming to, to show that a rack doesn't have a cycle. If a rack doesn't have a cycle, it means the representation doesn't have a circular weighting. As a result, we don't have deadlock. So it's easy to determine whether a rack contains a cycle. For an example, depth first search. I'm sure you know it uh, because it's covered in a data structure course. So let's take a look at an example. We have a rack here. This rack obviously can be reduced by picking process five. Process five says a unit of R6 and the units from uh, here. So process five can take both units and run. After process five runs, it returns this two. So process five becomes an isolated knot. So like here, then let's find another candidate. Obviously P4 is a good candidate because P4 has received two units and require requests for one more unit of R6 to run. So this unit can be given to P4. After P4 has it, then P4 and run would return everything. So P4 becomes a isolated knot. Now, after removing all edges, to and from uh, P4, we have this diagram. Then look at here. We could run P3. P3 has one unit from R6 and uh, requesting to use one unit of R4. As a result, this free one can be given to R3. Then P3 runs and uh, finishes. So these two edges are removed and P3 becomes a isolated knot. After P3 is done, and you can run P2 because what P2 needs is a unit of R2. Then when this unit is allocated to P2, P2 can run. When P2 is done, these three edges gone, then P1, of course, can run. 
So this example is very interesting, but we know because this rack is completely reduced. There's no deadlock according to the deadlock theorem. But look at the original diagram. This original diagram has a cycle, two cycles. The cycle P3, R4, P4, R6. And we also have a larger cycle here. So that reminds you something. That the deadlock theorem states that if the rack is not completely reducible, then we have a deadlock. So here we also know a deadlock happens. We have four conditions to hold. If we make one of the condition fails, deadlock is not have is not there. So remember this diagram. This rack is not in a deadlock state, but it contains cycles. Now, how about this? This is a another rack. Here we have three processes: P1, P2, P3. P1 receives one unit of R2 and requesting it requests to use a unit of R1, which is being held by P2. And P2 has one unit of R1 and one unit of R2, and requesting a unit of R3. This only unit of R3 is being held by P3. But P3 is requesting a unit of R2, which is not available. So we see we have a cycle here. We have a cycle here. Now, if you try to apply reduction, you can't do anything about that. You can't do anything about that because P1 cannot be used as a candidate for reduction because P1 cannot get this one. P2 cannot be used as a reduction candidate because it cannot get this one. P3 cannot be chosen as a candidate because P3 cannot get this one. Therefore, this rack cannot be completely reduced. As a result, we have a cycle. So we learn something. You cannot simply look, you cannot simply look at for cycles, and then you conclude there is a deadlock. No. You have to apply graph reduction until you can not further reduce the rack until it's completely reduced. Then you can conclude whether that state is a deadlock state. Now, I have an exercise for you. You are given this rack. Please convert it to a table to the table representation and do a step-by-step -step execution of the deadlock detection on the tables. And also apply rack reduction to this rack. Is this state a deadlock free state? So after uh, reading so many slides, what we can conclude is if a rack has no direct cycle, the corresponding allocation state is deadlock free. So we are searching for no direct cycle. Even though a rack has a direct, direct cycle, it does not mean the allocation state is a deadlock state. So what if a rack has a direct cycle? We have two cases. The first one is, it's obvious. If there, there is one unit per resource type, there is a deadlock because it's a complete cycle. One, notice here, if each resource type has only one unit, not one unit available, 
each resource type has one and only one unit from the very beginning, then a cycle implies a deadlock because this is a perfect circular waiting. Otherwise, a deadlock is only a possibility. You must use the rec reduction or de deadlock detection to determine whether the system is in a deadlock state. Hope you remember this. Now, you have a deadlock algorithm. What are your implementable representations or the rec reduction technique? Deadlock detection algorithm is not run when a request is made. When I was young, I used some systems. Those systems occasion would, would be deadlock. So during that time, each computer will have a operator sitting in, a, in their computer room. And he or she must initiate some action to deal with deadlock. So the system would have a deadlock detection algorithm building. Some very large operating system like the IBM MVS multiple virtual storage system. It has a very, very large uh, system resource management, management system, very, very large, very complex, in which there will be some deadlock detection and deadlock recovery. So this deadlock detection algorithm is run periodically when it is needed. It's not automatically run, but of course you can always do that. For an example, if deadlocks occur so frequently, then the deadlock algorithm should be invoked frequently. How long? Perhaps once per hour. But another indicator of deadlock is CPU utilization becomes low. Suppose your, syst your system has 100 processes and the 10 processes are involved in deadlock. So those deadlocked processes would not use CPU. Therefore, CPU utilization becomes low. For an example, uh, below 40%. Low CPU utilization usually means more processes are waiting. They may not be deadlocked. So once that is the case, we simply uh, invoke deadlock detection algorithm to determine whether we have a deadlock or not. But what if we do have a deadlock, then the deadlock recovery algorithm must be used. The algorithm may inform the system administrator or the operator to deal with it. And the deadlock uh, detection algorithm simply shows all the needed information to the operator or the system administrator so that they could make a sensible decision. Or you could allow the system to recover from a deadlock. There are usually two options, process termination, resource preemption. Remember, Re preempt something usually is preempting something usually means very troublesome. So these two options are not mutually exclusive. You could use both. So for process termination, you could kill all deadlock processes. Uh, the cost for this is usually very high. Or abort one process at a time until the deadlock cycle is eliminated. So suppose you have 10 processes involving a deadlock P0, P1, you could kill them one at a time. But aborting a process may not be easy. What if, what if a process is updating or printing a very large file? Or that process is near the end of its execution cycle. So in this case, will you be able to allow the, the, the process to run in some other time and probably continue with the unfinished work. Termination may be determined by priority importance 
of a process. When I was young, system usually usually can be can deadlock. So there is a feature called a checkpoint. A checkpoint is a system call. Your system, after finishing some very crucial step or important work, you call, your program calls a checkpoint feature. So the checkpoint feature simply saves everything in the system. Probably close your file to some degree and write everything you have in, in, the, in memory to a temporary file. So after this, uh, this is done, very similar to the new, new system to slip. You ask a system to slip, then how will you be able to restart, uh, resume the execution of your process? It's just like that. So if the, your process is involved in a deadlock, after you execute a checkpoint, next time you run your program from there. So your loss is just very little. So this is process termination. Now resource preemption, still you have to select a victim, but which resource and which processes are to be preempted? This is difficult decision. Uh, we have a rollback. If we preempt the resource from a process, what should be done with that process? As I mentioned, um, uh, in the ter uh, process termination, we could have a checkpoint. So we have total rollback, abort the process and restart it. In partial rollback, roll back the process only as far as necessary to break the deadlock. For example, my process has done 10 checkpoints, say uh, checkpoint one to checkpoint 10. And before I reach Checkpoint 11, the system finds out my process involves in the deadlock. So the system can partially roll back my program, restart my process at the beginning of checkpoint 11. That is right after the end of checkpoint 10. So between the time my process was kills or due to uh, resource preemption to the time my process is partially rolled back, rolled back. I don't have a particular resource. And finally, always watch out for starvation. We cannot always pick the same process as a victim. Some limit, some rule, must be set so that a process or a particular resource will be picked over and over. And then this is what about deadlock detection. Next, we talk about some simple things which usually occur when you use a recursive lock. We call it live lock. What is a live lock? If two or more processes continually react, uh, re repeat the same interaction in response to changes in the other processes without doing any useful work. Well, although this is a joke, but this happens very frequently, consider the interaction between the White House and the uh, the Congress. Congress proposed send a bill to, to the president. The president vetoes. us. And what if the Congress has cannot override uh, the president's veto? Then the Congress come up with another bill and send to the White House. Then the president vetoes it again. So each of White House and the Congress reacts to the other party's activity. It, nothing useful could be done. When I was a, uh, 
and not a real story. When I was a graduate student, Sunday, I usually take a to bus for grocery shopping. The nearest bus is close to a church. Those gentlemen uh, or ladies after church service, they want to take bus home or to somewhere. One day, the line, the first two person at the very beginning of line were two gentlemen. When the bus stops, the driver op opened the door. Gentleman A said, please after you. Gentleman B was so polite, also saying, please after you. And then gentleman A said, please after you. And gentleman B said, please after you. So these two gentlemen kept saying, please after you, please after you. And the bus driver did not see any passengers slip on board. So he just closed the door and drove away. So <clears throat> this is a typical life lock. So the important thing to remember is these processes are not in a waiting state. They are all running concurrently. So this is different from a deadlock because in a deadlock state, all processes are in the waiting state. How can we have this? Look at this very simple program. We have two locks, mutex one, mutex two. This is a process, say process, process lock the mutex one first and check to see whether mutex two is locked. Some system has this lock. Is locked as a function. When a process calls is locked. If the lock is not locked, is not occupied, so the caller would get that lock. And if, and returns true. And when a process calls is locked, unfortunately, if that lock is locked, then it returns true if it's a, so if it, it is locked, then this process goes down, releases lock, wait for a while, and locks its own lock. It comes back to check whether the other lock is locked. If the other lock is not locked, well, this while loop is done. So lock the second lock. So let me quickly go through it. Say process one locks its own lock, mutex one. And then check to see whether process two's lock is locked. And if the process two's lock is locked, then unlock my lock. Wait for a while, relock my own lock. And check to see whether the other guy's lock is locked. If the other guy's lock is not locked, then I lock the other one. So, under Thremender, this kind of lock is not supported because you can easily get into the following situation. Look at this. Process two locks its own lock. And check to see whether process one's lock is locked. If it is, so process two release its own lock, wait for a while, locks its own lock again, goes back to see whether the other party's lock is locked. If it's not, then it locks. Uh, this lock, okay? So this two look quite symmetric and quite innocent, but it's problematic. Why? Let's take a look at this. If process one and process two are execute, are executing in a fully synchronized way, line by line. So while process one locks mutex one, Process two locks mutex two. They both enter the while loop. They both cease the other party's lock is locked. Both enters their own while loop and then unlock their own lock. 
and wait for is at the same time and back to relock their own lock and goes back to check the other party's lock. Oh, what? Of course, it is all already locked. So they would keep looping here forever. And this is a live lock. They are running. Everyone is responding to the other part's activity. So we have a live lock. Each process reacts to the other party's activity. Nothing meaningful is achieved. So how can we overcome this problem? Remember, if you order the execution, uh, the resource here, the resource contains two locks, mutex one and mutex two. If we order this resource in a hierarchical way, that lock will not happen. So what does that mean? It means each process must acquire mutex one before you acquire mutex two. So you get mutex one and uh, lock mutex two. Here you lock mutex one and lock mutex two. That makes it very simple. Isn't it very similar to finding philosopher problem? Mutex one is for left sharp sticks, mutex two is for right sharp sticks. Or if your, if your application allows you combine mutex one and mutex two together so that you only have one mutex. So everyone wants, when it wants to do something, just lock that mutex. So avoid, if it is possible, avoid to use this kind because you, have, you, you are likely to have a tendency to involve in a, a life lock. So that ends our deadlock detection. And actually, this is also the end of the major topics of this concurrent computing course. The remaining lectures are for references, which includes a short discussion of message passing, which you will learn a lot about it in a distributed course. And we also shows you other language or system would implement uh, the synchronization stuff, which are very similar to what ThreadMender did for you. The first system we will talk about is a very simple survey of Java's concurrent capability. Then we we'll step into a very interesting language that implement synchronization purely by message passing, which is the language Ada. And finally, we we'll talk about a very popular system, P threads. Then that's the end of this course. Hopefully you get everything we presented here regarding deadlock. Then I have to say goodbye. Let me stop here and good luck. <laughs>